When we start quilting, before you get to the finish line, you need to buy batting to make your quilt sandwich. But how in the world do you choose from the dozens of choices out there? Today's guest is going to answer all your questions. Stephanie Hackney is the Director of Sales and Marketing for Hobbs Batting. I asked a million questions for those of you who are just starting out, or making your fifth quilt, or making your 50th. She was an excellent guest, and I cannot wait for you to see the interview. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here's my interview with Stephanie Hackney. Thank you so much for being on my show. My audience has so many bazillion questions about batting that I really just don't have the answers for. But before we get to that, I'm going to ask you, are you a crafter? Are you a quilter? What do you do? I have crafted all my life. I started out crocheting. Um, my mom taught me when I was eight, so I've always created. Um, so I do a lot of different things. Um, I sew, I quilt, I paper craft, I make cards, I scrapbook. Um, I've done macrame and needlepoint and, you know, whatever the craft du jour was when I was a kid. So yes, I've always been creative and I've worked in the creative industry, either as a member of the media or within companies or running my own company. Do you consider yourself currently a quilter? Yes. Although I don't have a whole lot of time for it, <laughs> which is a, unfortunate, you know, you know how it is. I mean, it is I, a marathon it, craft. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to be working on a bunch of projects. I have a big presentation in a couple of weeks. And so I'm going to be working on some home decor projects uh, this coming weekend. So I'm looking forward to having some real dedicated time to do that. Now, did you come from a family of crafters or is this just something that you picked up? I did, um, I, but I would say they were probably creatives out of necessity. Um, I was a military brat. So my mom, um, you know, had very little money to work with. And so she was always very creative. Um, she also was born, you know, right after World War II. And so she learned to sew and do everything from a really young age. Um, and so she's always made her own clothes. She made my clothes when I was little. Um, she actually went to fashion design school. So she is an, an amazing seamstress. Um, and uh, so a lot of that got passed down. And my great grandmother, my grandmother before her, they all did all kinds of different needle arts. Wonderful. How long have you been with uh, Hobbs Batting? Four and a half years. Four and a half years. And did you know a lot about batting before you started? I knew very little about batting when I started. It was in the paper crafting industry before I came to Hobbs. I was recruited uh, for the role. Um, and so my very first week on the job, I think I'd been with the company like 10 days. I went to Quilt Market and it was the most amazing and totally overwhelming <laughs> environment because I'd never been to anything like that. You know, I've been to a lot of other craft industry trade shows and other segments and retailer shows, but nothing like, like market. Oh me. my, my yeah. Lord, that is such a overwhelming experience. Luckily, the gal who used to be one of our lead educators uh, for the company, Becky Rich Richards, um, she had actually come in and done like hand walked me through the floor and introduced me to everybody and explained who all the players were. Um, so that gave me a head start. Um, and then within six months, I was out lecturing about batting. Let's just go through the nomenclature, okay? Like there, if a person's a new quilter, they're going to hear all these different terms. So batting, just when somebody talks about batting, what are they talking about? Okay, so batting is actually what's referred to as a non-woven textile, meaning that it's not woven like fabric is. It's loose, uh, loose materials that are blended together. We use needle punching to to get those fibers to stick, basically. Um, so if you've ever done wool felting where you take the needles with a little block, it's the same kind of concept. You're taking the fibers and you're punching needles through them to, to get them to hold together and be stable. So the batting is what goes in the middle of the quilt. It's what gives it the puff. It's what gives it that cuddly feeling. Um, if you have an old quilt, like an old vintage quilt or your grandma's quilt, and it was super soft and cuddly, um, generally that's the batting that was inside of it. I interviewed a woman on the show a couple of months ago 
And she said that her grandmother used to take socks and cut them in half and lay them down. And that's what they used for batting. Right. And I think, you know, for quilting, I mean, it when it started, it was whatever you had on hand, right? I mean, the, yeah. the original quilts, if you look at some of the old vintage quilts, they're made from flower sacks. So they used to, um, that was actually one of the first steps in branding was that you used to go to your general store and they had a big barrel and it had flour, it had sugar, whatever it might be. And so you would go in and you would buy that by the cup or the pound or the ounce or however they measured it. Um, and then you would take it home and you would use it. Well, every time you went back, there was no guarantee you were getting the same brand, right? Because there was no branding around that. It was just a product, a kind of a, a commodity. And so the uh, company started realizing that they had an opportunity to put their brand out there. And so they started putting their brand on the flower sacks and then people would use those. And they figured out that the, the um, housewives were using those to make things, that they were using it as fabric for clothing or for quilts or blankets or whatever it might be, maybe even for mending something. Um, and so that's when they started making them colored, you know, where you have all the different patterns on yeah. them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it's interesting that, you know, a lot of older quilts, we get calls a lot where somebody will say, I have an older quilt from my grandmother and I took it all apart and I cannot tell what this is that she had in here. And I said, you know, it may not have been any kind of a batting product. Um, people use the old army wool blankets, right, yeah. to put in because those would make a really nice, warm, heavy quilt. If people had sheep on their farm, they might have, you know, taken the wool that they didn't sell and pack that in there. Um, but I think it was a, you know, it was whatever you had on hand. I hear long staple cotton used a lot when you're talking about batting. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just, it's a quality of the cotton. And it's just like with polyester, we have high denier polyester, right? Or fine denier polyester. It's the quality of the cotton or the quality of the fiber that we're using to make the batting. And it means that it's of, of high quality. What does loft refer to? So loft is what we refer to as the puff, right? So if you if you pick up a, a wool batting or a polyester batting, you're going to have a lot of loft. That means they're going to be sort of puffy. Um, I actually have a couple here with me just so I can show that. Um, so this is loft, right? So this shows how puffy this is. Needle punched, what does that mean? Needle punch is what I was just explaining that we use needle boards to punch the fibers, right? And that connects the fibers and locks them together. So in the case of making batting, you have very long boards. They're about this wide and they're as tall as I am and they have you know, hundreds to thousands of needles on them that are about this long. They're very, very sharp. And the batting actually goes through that. And then the needle punching takes place. So can you have batting that's not needle punched? All of our battings are needle punched. So I can't speak for other brands, but our, our battings are needle punched. And scrim. Scrim, I can actually show you that as well. Uh, scrim is a stabilizing layer, um, like an interfacing, if you've made clothing with interfacing. So this is a, a, a cotton with scrim. So this is the scrim layer. And it is just a very thin, this happens to be polyester, very thin, very soft, but also very strong. And the purpose of it is to strengthen a product, right? So just like an interfacing or a stabilizer with normal cotton, if you pull on it really hard, it stretches out of shape. This one has the scrim needle punched into the cotton fiber, so it's not going to stretch out of shape. What is bearding? <laughs> so bearding is that horrible moment uh, when batting comes through the through the fabric, right? And you see little little puffs or maybe big puffs, hopefully not. Um, but it is something that generally is going to be, it, it's caused by a few different things. If you want me to go in that, into that, I can. Um, but bearding is, is generally in a quilter's life, it's a really bad day when that it's happens. It's a really bad thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> and if you experience bearding, you don't want to continue. You want to stop and fix the, the cause of it um, because it will not get better. And if you wash a quilt that's already had bearding issues, it usually will just make it worse. It'll make more and more of the batting puff through. Once it starts, is there anything you can do to stop it? If you're starting to get bearding, stop and take your needle out of your machine. Feel your needle. Sometimes it's a little bit dull. Sometimes it's got a little burr on it and that can pull batting up through the fabric as it's stitching. Um, so put in a brand new needle. We suggest 
all quilts start with a brand new needle anyway. Um, so go ahead and put in a brand new needle and start again. If you're still seeing bearding, take your needle out and go down one size. And you may say, well, but I always use that size needle. Well, it may be the combination of the tension, the thread that you're using, the fabric you're using and the batting you're using. That what's happening is the needle is a little too big. And as it comes back through, it's pulling the batting up through the stitch holes. If you are still having bearding after doing that, um, then you wanna check the tension on your machine because the tension could be the issue. Now, if I've washed my quilt and I've got bearding, mm -hmm. is there anything I can do then? Or is it too late? Yeah, I mean, you can, you know, obviously you can go in with like a lint, you know, a lint remover or one of those little combs, you know, and take it off. Sometimes that will correct the issue. You know, you can take off what's on the surface um, and then just make sure to very delicately wash or soak your quilts from there on. But generally when a quilt starts bearding, it's going to continue to beard. And the key thing is you always want to start with the best quality fabric. So we recommend 200 thread count or higher. Um, so if you're buying, you know, good quality quilt shop fabric, um, any of the major brands that sell fabric, you should not have an issue. If you're buying really inexpensive fabric that has a, you know, weave that <laughs> looks like that when you yeah. hold it up, you see light through it. Um, chances are you're going to have some bearding issues no matter what kind of batting you put in it. Shrinkage. Uh, so many people ask mm -hmm. me, should you pre-wash your batting? And I say no. Should you? We do not recommend pre-washing batting. Um, and here's why, because most people don't do it in the proper way. And if you just throw raw batting into the washing machine, it's going to get agitated or spun. It's going to stretch it out of shape. It could even put holes in it. Um, once you do that, it's ruined. So um, we do not recommend pre-washing batting. There is a method doing it that involves sheets and a warm tub and <laughs> it's quite a bit quite a bit of work um, if you're you know and the primary reason people do it is if they've pre-shunk their fabrics and they don't want to have that crinkly look which will happen if you put a shrinking batting behind a pre-shrunk fabric um, so again you can do it but it requires a very specific method and we don't recommend it it's not actually good for the batting to be washed outside of a quilt i noticed on your website that you have two different types of cotton you have an 80 20 and you have a hundred percent and there's like 10 different varieties why mm -hmm. would i choose one over over another first of all they they have different qualities um, so the cotton by itself is going to be, you know, a soft, warm fiber. It's what most people like to use in their quilts. Um, and it's going to give you that traditional crinkled look, right? Because it is going to shrink up some behind your fabrics and it's going to create the traditional quilt top look. The potential downside of, of cotton, and this is not always a downside, is that it can be heavy, right? Cotton is the heaviest of all the fibers that, that we make batting from. Um, and so that can create an issue if you've got somebody who has dexterity issues, strength issues, and you make a really big quilt, cotton can be heavy for them. Um, and you can get warmth without necessarily having to have weight. So there are some fibers you might want to switch to uh, if you're looking for warmth, and that's the reason you choose cotton. Cotton can also be quite delicate. As I mentioned just a moment ago with the scrim, if you really pull on our just regular cotton batting, right? You can distort it out of shape because it's just 100% cotton. There's nothing else in it. So if you think about a cotton ball and you start pulling on a cotton ball, what happens, right? The fibers will only hold for so long. So that's just something to consider, especially if you're buying big rolls and you're going to load them onto a uh, long arm machine. You want to be really careful when you do that first pull that you don't stretch it out of shape. So why would you want to use like an 80-20 cotton blend? We also have a cotton and wool blend. The 20% of the other fiber gives it some different characteristics and it can also make it lighter. Okay, so cotton is a breathable fiber. We have it blended with polyester. So it's an 80-20 cotton, 20% uh, polyester. And the 20% polyester makes it a little bit loftier and it makes it a little bit lighter because the polyester has almost no weight to it. So that's one of the benefits there. It makes it a little bit stronger 
and a little bit um, more durable over time. So it's the reason that we recommend the 80-20 cotton poly for charity quilts and baby quilts, because we know those get a lot of use and abuse. They may need to get washed a lot in warm water and that batting will hold up to that. The cotton wool is gonna give you a little bit more loft even than the 80-20 cotton poly. And the really great thing about the cotton wool is that both of those fibers are natural, meaning that that quilt's gonna be a little cooler it's going to breathe and it'll be great for year round use. That's not to say the 80-20 cotton poly isn't, but that 20% polyester, remember that polyester is a man-made fiber. So it's gonna behave a little bit differently. Why does somebody quilt with wool over basic cotton? So a few different reasons. It, first of all, we, we have five questions that we ask people when they're asking for advice on batting. The first question is, what are you making? The second is what kind of a finish do you want, like a texture or finish or look on the surface of your quilt or on the back of your quilt? Um, who's it for? What's the use case and how's it going to be cared for? So as I mentioned, most people started quilting with cotton. That's what they originally started using or maybe even the 80-20. The um, and they like the way that feels, right? And, and the, the finish it gives. But if you're making something like a show quilt, you do not want to use 100% cotton because cotton holds creases. So when you fold up your beautiful show quilt that you've spent untold hours and money on uh, and you send it in, it's going to be creased for a very long time until it gets judged and it's going to be sitting creased again until it gets hung. And so a lot of times when you walk through a, a quilt show and you see these amazing quilts, but they have real deep creases in them, that's because of cotton batting. Now cotton, that, you know, it doesn't mean it's a bad fiber. It's a great fiber and it makes a beautiful cuddly quilt, but it isn't best for all use cases. So you always need to be thinking about what you're making and what the use case is. If you're making show quilt, we recommend using wool. So, and the reason for that is number one, it's gonna emphasize your piecing and stitching. And number two, it's gonna give you really nice loft and it has no memory for creases. So when you fold up a quilt made with wool, even when you open it up and you see a little creasing, you hang it up and within 20, 30 minutes, there's no creases left in the quilt. So that's why a lot of quilts are made, a lot of show quilts are made with wool and most of them are double batted, meaning that they've got two layers of batting in them. And that's to give it that puff. Correct. It could be for the puff. It could also be to get the quilt to hang really straight because okay. wool by itself, like poly, is really, really lightweight. And if you're making a very elaborate, very big quilt, uh, especially one with a lot of piecing, sometimes the quilt isn't completely square. And so adding a heftier kind of like an 80-20 cotton poly or an 80-20 cotton wool blend on the back can help to, to make it hang and uh, look really nice. Also, it will give you more loft to the stitching on the back since you normally don't piece the back and you only have stitching. You want something that's gonna show off the stitching when the judges turn the quilt over. Silk is another good pairing. Uh, we have a lot of quilts that we make with wool and silk together. Again, both natural fibers, they both drape beautifully and they give very different effect. So this is a common one. A person is making their first quilt. Their piecing might be less than perfect. Mm -hmm. It most likely will be a gift or a bed quilt. What product should they choose for their first quilt? 80-20. 80-20. So yeah. So number one, um, we provide the teacher batting for most of the major shows. So we do that as a company, we provide it for free to the teachers who are teaching because we know that with the 80-20, it's going to work well, whether they're first time long armors or they're first time on a domestic machine. It's thin enough that you can roll a quilt and very easily maneuver it through the throat of a domestic machine. Um, so it can be really good for that. Also, you don't, again, don't have to worry as much about washing and drying with the 80-20 batting. So if it is a gift quilt, a quilt you're not gonna be able to maybe meet the end user or to um, convey to them how it needs to be washed, or you're giving, let's say you're sending a kid off to college, you're making them a quilt for the dorm, right? I mean, if they've ever washed their own laundry at all, they're probably gonna throw it in a big washer with everything else, with warm water, who knows what kind of detergent. So you really wanna make sure that you're giving them a batting that can hold up to that kind of use. If somebody is hand quilting, what is the best type of batting for hand quilting? So we have three in our line that we recommend. The first one is wool. The second one is silk, and the third one would be one of the polys, most specifically Thermore, which is a very strong batting. It's 100% polyester. It's very, very thin. 
um, and it is was primarily designed for clothing and miniatures when it first came out, but it has a lot of great insulating properties. It's very strong. You can actually stitch up to 10 inches apart on it. So if you're ever going to hand tie a quilt, that's a batting that we recommend because you can you don't have to have so the stitching so close together to keep the batting stable. Um, but the wool and the silk, it's if you were to take a stick of butter and set it on the counter for a few hours, right? It's real soft. Now thread a needle and run it through that. That's what it's like to hand quilt through the wool and the silk, right? It provides no resistance to your hand. We recommend people not use cotton for hand quilting, although we know a lot of people do, because as you're past, trying to pass, especially a cotton thread through the cotton batting and fabric, it'll create a lot of resistance where the, the fibers want to kind of catch each other. Um, and that makes your hands tired more quickly. Another category that people are making a lot and a lot of people coming to quilting make it is they're making a t-shirt quilt. They, mm -hmm. They're just assembling together all sorts of souvenirs. They could be t-shirts, they could be hockey jerseys, they could be all sorts of different things. They're stretchy. They might have interfacing on the back. What would you recommend for that type of quilt? From all the quilters that we've ever talked to about t-shirt quilts, all of them recommend stabilizing the t-shirt panels. So, and what I, I find a lot of them do is they will actually stabilize basically the whole front of the t-shirt or the whole back, depending on where the design is. And then they will cut out their panel, right? So then they'll put their maybe 12 by 12 ruler on it and cut it out. So one of the challenges with t-shirt quilts, as you mentioned, is that they are stretchy, right? Also, they've already been worn and washed. Most most t-shirt quilts are made with t-shirts that somebody has used. So they've already shrunk. They're not gonna shrink anymore. Um, you also need to remember that they are made out of cotton and they're heavy, right? If you take a big stack of t-shirts, they weigh a lot. So now if you add a cotton batting behind that, you're making an extremely heavy quilt. So we recommend the Thermor. Um, it is 100% polyester. It does not shrink at all. So that takes care of the shrinking issue, right? Because if you have flat panels on t-shirts and you really want to be able to see the design, you don't want your batting shrinking underneath and giving it that traditional quilt look, generally. Some people do like that, most people don't. So if you put a non-shrinking batting, which the Thermor does not shrink, you put that behind it, it'll stay nice and flat. The other thing is that the t-shirt quilt's going to be heavy. The Thermor has no weight. I mean, a queen, a queen size bat of Thermor weighs about as much as this little lint roller, right? There's really no weight to it. Um, the next thing is that normally people don't like you to stitch through the designs on their t-shirts, right? They're very protective of the t-shirts. So with a Thermor, you can go 10 inches apart, which means you can generally get around the design of the shirt which is really nice. And if then if you're gonna add any sashing, you know, you can do an additional stitch in there if you want to, but it's not necessary. As long as you're every 10 inches, it'll hold up just fine. So again, the benefits are, it doesn't shrink. It doesn't add any weight. It keeps the surface really nice and flat. And it's a really strong, durable quilt, right? Because a lot of times people are making those for kids going off to college, kids who've just finished kind of high school sports, that type of thing. Um, and again, it can take a lot of use and abuse. I'm working on a dark quilt. Is there anything I should watch for? Yes, I would absolutely use a dark batting if you can. We happen to have a black batting. Okay, this is the 8020. So this is one of the versions you mentioned. It's 80% cotton um, that has been dyed. It is color fast dye, so it's not going to bleed. Um, and then it's 20% polyester. The really nice thing about that is that not only will it make it so that you know your darks stay real dark, you're not going to see any light batting coming through them. You don't have to do this at the end of your quilt right? Because if you make a quilt, you make all dark fabrics, black or even real dark fabrics, and you use a light batting, you're going to have light lint all over the quilt. I that could you not believe off. how much lint I took off my dark yeah. quilt. Like it's yeah. just and, and you'll have none of that with the black batting. And how about vice versa? If I'm working with a white quilt, what should I be doing? Mm -hmm. So we make bleach versions of two of our batting. So the like the uh, banner that's behind me, that is a very, very white fabric. And we want that to stay really white. So we happen to use polyester behind this. Um, because that is going to, it's going to stay nice and white. The polyester is white, um, but we also make a cotton and we make an 80-20 that's made from bleached cotton. 
and that will stay nice and white. And that's great, not just for white fabrics, but also all of your pastel colors, right? So any really yeah. light colors, it'll look really good with. I'm always amazed at how trans, well, I'm going to say translucent, but you know, like I've got some creams, I've got some light blues, mm -hmm. a light pink and shocking how much those dark fibers can shine through the other side of them. You know, with this quilt here, um, the back is just as white. It's just solid white on the back. Um, and we actually put the silk in. Now the silk is not a white batting. It's a natural color batting, right? It's natural silk. And it doesn't dull it, but it depends on your fabric, right? This is very high, high quality Kona cotton. It's a thicker cotton, you know, it, and it's can kind of hold its own against, you know, a batting coming through. Um, but if you have the opportunity to use a bleach batting, that's what we recommend, that or polyester. So most of us are using quilting cottons, but if I'm using batik or silk, mm -hmm. or maybe I've grabbed a sheet to use for the back, is there any recommendations for batting that if I'm using those type of products? So generally, if you're going to use a sheet, we recommend at least 200 thread count right? Because you want to make sure it's got a tight enough weed that you're not going to have batting coming through it. You can pretty much use any one of our, in our, our battings with batiks. I would say a lot of people like to use the silk um, because the, the batik tends to be a very fine, very tightly woven fabric. Mm -hmm. um, having something that helps it drape really nice is, is a great solution. And the silk is the drapiest batting that we have. Now, when you get it, when you first look at it, if you ever open it, I like to tell people this because most people are shocked. They open the bag and they're like, this isn't silky at all. It is actually raw silk. And it's more akin to Dupiani silk than like silky pajamas, right? Right. So it is, it is going to feel a little rough and a little bit stiff. You put it in your quilt or your jacket or whatever you're going to make with it. One washing and it is like this, right? It's just super soft, has a beautiful drape. So that's just something to keep in mind. We like to recommend the silk to be used with batik, but you know, if you're making a quilt, let's say you're doing a lot of piecing and you really want a lot of loft, the silk is not a good choice because it's very flat. So then you might want to go to the wool. Um, if you're making it for someone else and you're concerned about how they're going to wash it, then we would go with 80-20. Many quilters live in very warm parts of the world, but they still mm -hmm. want to have a quilt. Right. What batting do you recommend for them? So we are in Texas and a lot of my education team is in Houston and Houston is hot and humid pretty much all year round. Almost all the quilts we make here are either wool or silk. And I know a lot of people when I say wool, because I do a lot of lectures like for quilt guilds in the south they, they all look at me like you're nuts there's no way I'm going to put wool in my quilt what you have to understand is wool naturally wicks and it breathes because it's a natural fiber so if you this is the example I give if you were going to go hiking in Costa Rica where it's hot and humid all the time and you're going to you know go to REI and you're going to say give me a really good pair of hiking socks for Costa Rica they're not going to sell you cotton socks they're going to sell you wool socks because the wool socks will wick moisture, they're antimicrobial, and they're really good for a hot climate. So generally we will recommend um, that people use wool and silk. Now, if they don't wanna wash the quilt, cold water and delicate cycle, what, which is what's required for those battings, you can use um, an 80-20. Um, I generally don't recommend using all cotton um, unless you're using one of our really, really thin cottons. Uh, because it will be a warmer quilt. So when you list your different products, mm -hmm. how do I know whether, like different cottons, how do I know which ones have the bigger loft and which ones have the thinner loft? So on our um, product page, if you go to hobsbatting.com forward slash products, if you scroll down a little bit on that page, there is a grid chart that actually tells you a little bit about each of these products. It's the technical information. This is it here. And basically it's gonna have all these columns. So it has the product name, the type, the approximate loft, how much it shrinks, how far apart you should stitch, um, and then what it's best for. Um, and the most important things in those, in that grid chart are, how well the loft is important as well but how much it shrinks and how far apart to stitch and we find that a lot of quilters don't pay attention to those recommendations they will go ahead and you know stitch every 
six or seven inches when we say every four inches. And what you need to understand is that we know that at that stitch width, the batting is going to remain stable. It's gonna hold up really well, even for a quilt that you want to become an heirloom, um, and the batting's not gonna migrate or bunch. If you go wider than that, and especially if you go a lot wider than that, then batting can migrate over time. And you will find, doesn't matter which brand you're buying, all brands on their packaging, on their website, they will have a stitch width and they will say this batting can be stitched up to X number of inches apart. So if it says four inches, you need to stitch four inches or tighter, right? Closer together. So I've done a video on what to do with their extra batting scraps. What is your favorite thing to do with your batting scraps? First of all, we love doing what we call Franken batting, which is laying the pieces next to each other, running a zigzag stitch over. You don't want to overlap them. Um, and then reusing them, right? Using them in smaller projects or using them to, you know, make things that maybe you just have something little you want to make. But probably one of the best tips that somebody gave me, which I thought was awesome, is she uses it as an eraser to take the marks off her fabric. And I tried it and it works, at least with the, the marker, the pencils that, that we were both using. So when you mark your quilt up with your ruler or whatever you're using to mark it up, when you're all done, if you'll take your batting and kind of wad up the little scraps, you can kind of rub over it and it actually picks that up. Is that one of those special quilt markers, the blue one or the purple one? Yeah, well, like, you know, just like a pencil, a sewing pencil that you use for marking a pattern or marking, yeah. you know, widths on it or, you know, stitch lines or whatever it might be. But, you wow. know, she told me this was somebody I had in a lecture and I thought, wow, that's brilliant. I got to go home and try it. And I don't know what kind of pencil she was using, but the one I used, you know, it worked just fine. I had a Dritz pencil that, that I'd been using and it worked great. Okay, I'm gonna have to give that one a try. The other uh, great thing to do is if you have a humane society near you um, and people make dog or cat beds, you can donate your scraps and they will put those into the dog and cat beds. They love to have those. Yeah, so you just need to find someone that makes them and drop them Correct. off. Do you have any new products in the pipeline that we should know about? The newest product that we have um, is this one here. Um, and this is the 8020 Fusible in strips, okay? So it is one long roll. They're two and a quarter inches wide. They're made to be used like with your jelly roll fabrics because those are two and a half inches. And it is the 8020 and it is fusible on both sides. So we've already done the messy spray uh, for you. And all you do is just, you know, put it with your fabric. We recommend using a piece of parchment paper underneath it. So put your parchment paper, your batting and your fabric on top, and then you're going to press it in place. The key things for success is you want a very hot, very dry, no steam, dry iron. Um, and you want to be pressing, not ironing. So don't move the iron around about five to seven seconds in each spot. The great thing is then it fuses your fabric to your jelly roll strips and you can use it to make all sorts of things. So tote bags, jelly roll rugs, um, sashing, straps, quilt as you go projects. Um, also this and the regular 8020 fusible that's not cut into strips, that's bat size is really great if you're doing applique because you can actually adhere it to your fabric, put the fabric and the batting through like an AccuQuilt machine and cut out your shapes or use a template and cut out your shapes. And then it's still fusible on that other side. So now you just lay it on your quilt top, fuse it in place, and then do your stitching. I think you've answered every single question <laughs> that I have. <laughs> it's well, amazing. Good. It's amazing how just knowing little bits of information will make a big difference. I've often heard, you know, like Tula Pink, I think all her show quilts are done with a layer of wool and a layer of silk or a layer of cotton and a layer of wool to do so much traveling on the road. There's a lot of folding, a lot of hanging, and a lot of folding, a lot of hanging. And whereas myself, I just make them for beds. Well, and I think, again, that, that goes back to those five questions, right? It's really important to understand what the use case is going to be. Um, and, you know, if you were to come to me and say, I'm making a bed quilt, I would run you through that series of questions because I may say, okay, bed quilt, cotton wool, that's the best batting for a bed quilt where you're located. But then as we start to talk, I may suddenly find out that that bed quilt is for a guest bed, that that bed quilt is for a holiday and it's only brought out once a year and the rest of the year it's folded. 
right? So there's all these additional factors and we generally do a lot of questioning as somebody asks us for advice. So, you know, what I think one of the great things is there's a ton of information on every product on our website. We tell you what they're best for. We tell you things you maybe you don't want to use them for or they're great except for in this case. Um, but we also do lectures. So I do lectures two to four times a week via Zoom right now. Um, and we any guild that wants to bring their whole team and learn can do that. Um, I'm actually doing it one of the Canadian guilds um, in a couple months. So, you know, I think the key thing is to know that we are always there to provide the information. So if somebody has questions, they can reach out to me directly. They can call our office, they can email us, and we're happy to help them, you know, guide them in the right direction. But the key thing is just try batting, you know, try different things, because I think most people pick one or two they really love, and then they never go out of that, right? And what I'm finding is that as we do these lectures, a lot of people will email me after and say, I've only ever used cotton and now I'm so excited to try the wool. Or I've only ever used cotton and I wondered why every time I made a show quilt, right? It always had those creases in it. Right. So I, again, I think it's the knowledge is there. Uh, the information is there um, and you just have to reach out and ask for it. So the next question is, how do they contact you? So we, um, our website is www.hobsbatting.com and that's H-O-B-B-S, two Bs. Um, you can also call our main number, which is 254-741-0040. Um, people can also reach out to me directly. Um, I'm on Instagram a couple hours a day, every single day. Um, so you can always send me a direct message through Instagram and we're on Hobbs batting there. Um, or people can also email me or um, call my cell phone and you have my contact info and you're welcome to share that with people. Okay. I have people calling me from all over the world all the time. <laughs> asking, you know, they, they might have heard a lecture a year ago and they'll say, I know you said something about this batting, but I can't remember. It was a lot of information. Um, so always feel like you could reach out to us. We're happy to help. Great. I'll put uh, links to all that information in the notes below. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. Well, I'm very glad you came on and thank you so much for your help. Wow, I know, so many questions answered, and she has resources for us to download too, so there's no more guessing. I'll have links to all of these, plus all her contact information in the notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Wendy Chow of The Weekend Quilter, and we are talking about building a quilting community when you just start out. You don't want to miss it, so be sure to subscribe to my channel. Last week, I uploaded my video, Stash Buster number eight the latest in my Stash Buster series, which are fast and easy, and you shop from your stash and leaves little or no scraps. I'll put a link in the notes below and check out some of my other interviews on Karen's Quilt Circle too. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell beside the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Just Get It Done Quilts. And of course, my website where you can subscribe to my newsletter at JustGetItDoneQuilts.com. So take care and I'll see you next time.